We very well may need more early stage government support for potentially transformative technologies that cannot find industry backing. Infrastructural capital is equally crucial for new enterprises or smaller evolving ones. We may include in that research facilities, such as, as well as computational capability, instrumentation, robotics, clean rooms and materials fabrication and process facilities that no single startup company can afford. Some universities, in fact, have such critical infrastructure for research and education, but they cannot become simply an early stage platform for business since this may compromise their mission to educate and perhaps their tax status. So other models are needed. What are some alternatives? Shared infrastructure could be developed in certain sectors by industry consortia. It could be created at universities or federal laboratories in arm's length facilities with infrastructure specifically shared with nascent industries. An example is provided again by the Rensselaer Computational Center for Nanotechnology Innovations, a joint project of IBM, New York State, and Rensselaer. It not only hosts one of the world's most powerful university-based supercomputers, it allows companies of all sizes to perform research, simulations and modeling, and to tap the expertise of Rensselaer scientists and engineers who, otherwise would, be, who would otherwise be inaccessible. Yet the CCNI, as we call it, provides immense computational power for Rensselaer faculty use in basic research and education. In the words of Gary Passano and Willie Shi of Harvard Business School, an infrastructural commons co-located with the intellectual commons of the university is a powerful attractor. Now this is all well and good, but what about manufacturing itself? A recent piece in the Harvard Business Review by professors Passano and Shi suggests that in high-tech industries, new product development often grows out of process development for other products. By outsourcing the manufacture of semiconductors to Asia, for example, we have lost our capacity in thin film coating, which has limited the ability of our solar panel industry to create the most advanced products. So our, our ecosystem would be far healthier if we make it advantageous for manufacturers to build leading edge products in the United States. A change will require reassessment and revisions to tax policies and other financial incentives and possible regulatory policy changes at the federal and state levels. Many business, government, think tank, and academic groups are working through these and other policy issues. But let me stick to the bailiwick I know. We need to revitalize the manufacturing economy of the United States and emerging technologies again offer an important opportunity. From a technological point of view, the future of manufacturing lies in robotics, advanced materials, sensors, biotechnology, information technology, and new processes. We must decide to lead in these fields. More broadly, we can build upon the type of road mapping exercise undertaken by the National Science Board in robotics to identify important cutting edge technologies and new processes relevant across multiple fields that show the most promise for evolving manufacturing in key fields such as healthcare and energy, and to lay out the facilitating framework for deploying such te technologies in the United States. However, even the most advanced factory is meaningless if our ecosystem does not produce a workforce capable of staffing and running it. An innovation ecosystem must have human capital. Currently, given our large pool of unemployed workers, nearly every job opening attracts numerous applicants. Nonetheless, manufacturers cite an inability to find the right talent as one of their greatest concerns. The demands of advanced manufacturing require that every player in the ecosystem, universities, school systems, government at all levels, and businesses contribute to a comprehensive education and retraining effort for our labor force in new technology development and use. Possibilities include making worker training benefits portable and giving private industry a stake 
in creating a pipeline of workers through appropriate tax incentives. I need not tell you the United States is not educating enough scientifically literate people in general, technically skilled workers and scientists and engineers in particular. While job growth in science and engineering has been vigorous at about 4.2 percent per year since 1980, growth in science and engineering degree production has been comparatively weak at about 1.5 percent per year. And we are doing a particularly particularly poor job of recruiting to these fields the underrepresented majority of women and minorities. We have compensated for the gap by attracting foreign scientists and engineers, and we must do everything possible to ensure that we continue to attract and retain the best and the brightest from around the world. But we can't ignore our domestic talent. And so we are failing clearly to inspire many American children with the wonders of the natural world, mathematics, materials, and machines. I call this convergence of trends the quiet crisis. Quiet because it can take a generation to manifest itself fully in our economy, and because it takes decades to educate a world-class scientist or engineer. It is a crisis if there is a shortfall because of the pivotal role of scientists, engineers, innovators, and entrepreneurs in our economy. Clearly, we must work together to improve mathematics and science education from the very beginning of our children's educational careers, to help them understand the excitement of discovery and innovation, to nurture them, to ground them in the fundamentals, and to lead to advanced study those who will sustain our innovation ecosystem. Fortunately, all three partners in our innovation ecosystem understand the economic implications of STEM education, and many are working vigorously to improve it. Ohio, with its STEM learning network, has been a leader in partnering with industry in this effort. We also need innovation in pedagogy, in how we teach our students. We need to reach them where they are, take advantage of their natural exposure to technology, for instance, social networking, use virtual immersive environments, even games, to teach in new ways. Now at Rensselaer, for two years, supported by the Gates Foundation, we have had the privilege of hosting and working with teachers from Cleveland's two superb STEM schools, the MC Squared STEM High School and the Design Lab Early College High School in summer programs designed to share the insights we have developed in teaching undergraduates in a technological studio concept and multidisciplinary capstone project model. If we intend to improve STEM education, we must welcome K-12 teachers into the community of scientists and engineers to offer them both an opportunity for continuous learning and the respect they deserve. Ultimately, however, we will not reach a turning point in STEM education until we change our culture to celebrate the achievement of scientists, engineers, and innovators of all kinds, and those who teach them, while at the same time helping all of our children to imagine themselves in such roles. And this is a task that cannot be left to teachers alone. In the 1920s, President Calvin Coolidge famously asserted, and I quote, the chief business of the American people is business. That was his quote. Today, the chief business of the American people must focus on scientific discovery and technological innovation and the development of the talent to make them happen. It must be the chief business of children themselves, of parents, job seekers, titans of industry, artists, video game designers, educators, and elected officials. It is up to all of us to make this necessity more widely understood. 